Hello everyone, welcome back to the tutor. You're probably wondering, what are we going to be talking about today? And the answer is water. We'll be covering topics ranging from osmosis to water potential, tonicity, and osmoregulation. These may potentially be confusing topics due to all of the different chemical and quantitative concepts involved, so I'll try my best to clear things up. There will be plenty of practice problems along the way to help you with this. This is the first video I'm making to test the waters for online biology lessons, so I'd appreciate any feedback. Also, I'll try to tone down the puns from here, but it probably won't happen. <sighs> so, to understand topics like water potential, we first have to start with osmosis, which is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Imagine you had a beaker like the one pictured here, where the left and right sides were separated by a semi-permeable membrane, represented by the red line in the middle. If we take a closer look, you can see that the membrane is semi-permeable, or selectively permeable, because it only lets certain substances through. In this case, it lets small water molecules through those gaps in the middle, but not the larger green solute particles. They won't fit. Membranes can be semi-permeable for a variety of reasons, such as their polarity or charge, but in this case, size is the factor that doesn't let these green solute particles through. And just a little chemistry review, the solute is the substance that is dissolved in the water, which could be anything like salt, sugar, instant coffee powder, or those green particles in this case, while the water is called the solvent. If you put 50 milliliters of a solution that contained a very dilute, low concentration of these green solute particles in the left side, and 50 milliliters of a solution that contained a much higher concentration of those solutes in the right side, it would initially look like this. The water level on both sides would be the same. However, if you waited for a while and came back later, over time, the beaker would end up looking like this. Water molecules are in constant random motion, and over time, you can see that the water would tend to move across the membrane in the middle from the side with the lower green solute concentration to the side with the higher green solute concentration. The solute concentrations on each side of the membrane would become more similar until eventually the pressure difference resulting from the unequal heights of water on each side would be enough to stop osmosis. At this point, a dynamic equilibrium would be established with water molecules moving across the membrane both ways at the same rate, so the water level wouldn't change anymore past this point. We'll get to why the water moves this way in more depth later, but one important takeaway is this. Generally speaking, water will move from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration across a membrane during osmosis. This is an important idea to keep in mind, so make sure you're concentrating if we take a closer look, you can see, at equilibrium, for every water molecule that crosses the membrane from left to right by chance, another one crosses over from the right to left, so there is no net change in water levels. Now, you may also see someone try this in a device called a U-tube, which is a tube that looks like a U. Confusing, I know. If you separate the two sides with a semi-permeable membrane, and put a more concentrated solution in one side, in this case the left, over time, once again, water would move across the membrane to the side with a higher solute concentration, making the solute concentrations more similar on both sides until equilibrium was reached and the water levels would remain constant. Now let's take a molecular view to see why water moves from areas of low solute concentration to areas of high solute concentration. Imagine you had pure water on the left side of a semi-permeable membrane and a salt solution on the right side. When you dissolve a hydrophilic or water-loving substance like sugar or salt in water, water molecules will tightly cluster around the solute particles. In this case, you can see that when salt, which is sodium chloride or NaCl, is dissolved in water, the water molecules surround the individual ions, forming what are known as hydration shells. Since the water molecule is polar, meaning charges on the molecule are not evenly spread, the partially negative oxygen atom in the water molecule is attracted to the positive sodium ions, while the partially positive hydrogen atoms 
are attracted to the negative chloride ions. The clustering of water molecules around the ions makes these water molecules no longer free to cross the membrane because of the attractions between them and the ions. So because of this, more water molecules are free to move from the left side to the right side, in this case. When the water molecules are moving around randomly, they'll be more likely to cross the membrane from the left side to the right side than vice versa. So, the more solutes you add, the lower the amount of water that is free to move, which is why water will move from low to high solute concentration. Another way you can think of this is that water moves from a place of high to low free water concentration. So osmosis is really a form of diffusion in which water moves down a concentration gradient from high to low free water concentration. Here's another example of this with sugar. In this case, you can see the hydrogen bonds forming between water molecules and the sucrose molecule, since they are both polar, represented by the small dotted lines. Once again, the water on the side with the solutes clusters around the sugar molecule and becomes unable to move across the membrane, so more water would be free to move on the left than on the right. Sometimes, large molecules like these can even get in the way of water molecules and block the holes in the membrane, which is yet another reason why water on the side with more solutes would be less free to move. This idea of water molecules moving across semipermeable membranes through osmosis is very important in biology because the membranes of cells are semi-permeable membranes. Water molecules are small enough to cross directly through the lipid bilayer, but this is relatively slow and occurs in small amounts because the inside of the bilayer is hydrophobic, it doesn't get along with water well. However, water molecules can also cross in and out of the cell through channel proteins called aquaporins in much larger amounts, since these are hydrophilic. Also. It's important to note that when water moves across a membrane, as long as water is moving from a place of high to low free water concentration, the cell wouldn't have to put in any energy to make it move. This makes the movement of water through osmosis an example of passive transport, since no input of energy is required. We saw earlier with the beaker and the YouTube that we didn't need to do anything to make the water move, it just moved on its own. So how can we predict where water molecules will move using numbers? This brings us to water potential. The technical definition of water potential is a measure of the free energy of water per unit volume relative to pure water, but you don't really need to worry about that. What's really important is knowing that it is a number that helps you predict the net direction of osmosis. Water moves from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. The way I typically like to explain this is using a waterfall. The water in a waterfall moves from a high area to a low area, just like how water moves from high to low water potential. Water potential is represented by the Greek letter psi. You can remember that psi represents water potential because it looks kind of like a trident. Poseidon had a trident, along with King Triton from The Little Mermaid and King Neptune from that one SpongeBob movie, and they're all associated with water. Finally, water potential is measured in a pressure unit, such as bars, which is what they use on the AP formula sheet. A good example of the importance of water potential in nature is seen in trees. Since water moves from an area of high to low water potential, the roots of a tree will have a higher water potential than the trunk, leaves, and atmosphere respectively. This ensures that trees will be able to take in water through the roots and transport it to the leaves for photosynthesis, even going against gravity. Let's do some practice with predicting the direction of osmosis. Remember that water moves from high to low water potential. Imagine you had three solutions with different water potentials and an onion cell. If the onion cell were to be placed in solution A, would water flow in or out of the cell? That's correct! Or at least I hope it is, I can't hear you. If the onion cell were to be placed in solution A, water would flow out of the cell into the solution, because the solution has a lower water potential than the cell, and water flows from high to low water potential. If the onion cell were to be placed in solution B, the opposite would happen and water would flow into the onion cell from the solution, 
because the solution has a higher water potential than the cell, and water flows from high to low water potential. Now, if the onion cell were to be placed in solution C, there would be no net movement of water, because the onion cell and solution have the same water potential. Water is still moving across the membrane, it's just happening at a roughly equal rate both in and out, so there's no net movement of water. A concept related to water potential is tonicity, which measures the ability of a solution around a cell to cause that cell to gain or lose water. A hypertonic solution causes water to flow out of a cell, a hypotonic solution causes water to flow into a cell, and an isotonic solution causes no net movement of water in or out of a cell. It's important to keep in mind that these terms are all relative. A solution can be hypertonic to one cell, but hypotonic to another, depending on all of their individual water potentials. Let's go back to the practice problem we were just looking at and try to incorporate tonicity. Solution A has a lower water potential than the onion cell, so water will flow out of the onion cell into the solution. Since the solution causes the onion cell to lose water, Solution A is hypertonic to the onion cell. On the other hand, solution B has a higher water potential than the onion cell, so water would flow into the cell from the solution. Since solution B causes the onion cell to gain water, solution B is hypotonic to the onion cell. Solution C has the same water potential as the onion cell, so it is isotonic to the onion cell because there will be no net movement of water in or out of the cell. Now it's time for the formulas. Here we have the general formula for water potential. Water potential equals the pressure potential plus the solute potential, and we'll get to what these mean in a moment. One thing to take note of is that pure water will have a water potential of zero when it's in an open container at atmospheric pressure. Water potential is measured relative to pure water, so pure water kind of acts as a baseline, which is why it's zero. The solute potential is the component of water potential that accounts for the effect the solutes have. The solute potential is always zero for pure water, because there are no solutes in pure water, so they can't have any effect on it. In a solution that contains solutes, however, the solute potential is always negative, and adding solutes lowers the water potential. This is because solutes bind to water molecules, reducing their ability to move and therefore do work as we saw earlier. We also saw earlier that water flowed from areas of low solute concentration to high solute concentration, and water also flows from high to low water potential, so it makes sense that a higher solute concentration would be connected to a lower water potential. Here is the formula for calculating the solute potential. Solute potential equals negative ICRT, where I is the ionization constant, C is the molar concentration, R is the pressure constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. This seems complicated, but I'll break down each piece of the formula now. I, the ionization constant, tells you how many ions a certain solute will form when dissolved in water. When you place a molecular compound like sucrose, sugar, or glucose in water, the molecule will stay intact and it won't split into any ions. So for these substances, the ionization constant is always 1. For every molecule of sugar you have, there is one molecule of sugar in solution. For ionic compounds, however, they split into ions when placed in solution, so each individual ion counts as its own solute particle. For instance, I equals 2 for NaCl, or salt, so that's something to keep your eye on. So you can see here, when you place salt or NaCl into solution, it dissolves into its ions. For every one formula unit of NaCl, there are two particles in solution, the Na plus ion and the Cl minus ion, so the ionization constant is 2 here. C stands for the molar concentration, which tells you the solute concentration in molarity, or moles of solute per liter. R is the pressure constant, which always has a value of 0.0831 liter bars over moles kelvin. Don't worry too much about the units, just know that whenever you're working with water potential, 
you always plug this value in for r. Now one common misconception with concentration is that students sometimes confuse concentration with the total amount of a solution. Imagine you place a plant cell inside a big lake with these orange particles representing dissolved solutes. There are 18 of these particles in the solution inside the cell and 21 of these solute particles in the lake water. Some students may think that water would move out of the cell into the lake because there are more total solute particles in the lake water, but this is incorrect. Concentration measures the amount of solute there is in a certain amount of volume. So if we take a sample volume of lake water similar to the cell in size, you can see that there are far fewer solutes in the lake water than the cell per unit volume. The solutes in the lake water are much more spread out than the solutes in the solution in the cell, which are packed closely together, which is why the cell has a higher solute concentration, so water would move into the cell from the lake. Going back to negative ICRT, you can see that T stands for the temperature in Kelvin, which is another unit like degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. The Kelvin temperature equals 273 plus the Celsius temperature. So if the Celsius temperature was around 25 degrees Celsius, the Kelvin temperature would be 273 plus 25, which equals 298 Kelvin. Now it's on to the other component, pressure potential, which accounts for pressure's effect on water potential. It is always zero for solutions in open containers. This is significant, as it means for solutions in open containers, water potential equals the solute potential, since water potential is usually the solute plus pressure potential, and the pressure potential is zero. Pressure potential does exist in plant cells, due to the cell wall as Turger pressure, which we'll begin to discuss in a moment. But first, let's try water potential calculation problems similar to the quantitative problems you may see on the AP test. Feel free to pause the video and try this on your own, but I'll walk through it step by step. I've included the information you get on the AP formula sheet here, just for practice purposes as well. So in this problem, it says a plant cell with a water potential of negative 3.5 bars is placed into a 0.63 molar NaCl solution at 35 degrees Celsius in an open beaker. Calculate the initial water potential of the solution, round to one decimal place. So this problem is asking us to calculate the initial water potential of the solution in the open beaker. So remember that water potential equals pressure potential plus the solute potential. However, as you can see it reminds you on the formula sheet, the water potential will be equal to the solute potential of a solution in an open container because the pressure potential of the solution in an open container is zero. So all we have to do is find the solute potential now. We can see that the solute potential is given by negative ICRT, and let's try to find all of the variables to plug in from the problem. It tells us that we're working with an NaCl solution, and we saw earlier that sodium chloride, or salt, splits into two ions in solution. So the ionization constant, I, is two. They also give us the molar concentration of the solution in the problem when they say a 0.63 molar NaCl solution. So we know C equals 0.63. R is always going to be 0.0831 when working with bars. For the temperature, they give us 35 degrees Celsius, but we have to convert that to Kelvin by adding 273. Plugging in all of the numbers and rounding, we get a water potential of negative 32.2 bars. Also, notice that they gave us the water potential of the plant cell in the problem, even though you didn't have to use that anywhere, so watch out for extraneous information like that. Here we have another problem with calculating water potential, except this one is a bit different because we have to calculate the water potential of a solution with two different solutes in it. An open container at 23 degrees Celsius contains a solution with 0.2 molar glucose and 0.3 molar NaCl. What is the water potential of the solution? So in this problem, we have a solution with two different solutes in it, glucose and NaCl, and when this happens, we can find the water potential for the solution by finding the solute potentials
for each individual solute and adding them together, the water potential would be equal to the solute potential in this case once again, because the solution is in an open container, so the water potential equals negative ICRT. Starting with glucose, I is 1 because glucose does not ionize in water. C, the molar concentration, is 0 0.2 molar. R is always 0 0.0831. And T, the temperature, is 23 degrees Celsius, which would be 296 Kelvin. Plugging these into the formula gives us a water potential of about negative 4.92 bars for the glucose. For the NaCl, we know that the ionization constant is 2 because NaCl forms two ions in solution. C is 0 0.3 molar from the problem. And R and T are the same as glucose because the temperature didn't change and R is a constant. Plugging in the numbers like last time gives us a value of negative 14.76 bars. Finally, for the total water potential of the solution, we add the water potential of the NaCl and glucose from the last step to get negative 19.7 bars. Going back to take a more in-depth look at pressure potential, we have to look at how osmosis can have very different effects on animal and plant cells due to differences in their structures. Animal cells do not have cell walls, while plant cells do, and this leads them to behave differently in solutions of varying water potential. Here we have animal cells, specifically red blood cells. In a hypertonic solution, the cells will lose water through osmosis and shrivel up. In red blood cells, this is referred to as crenation. In an isotonic solution, water will move in and out of the cell at the same rate, so the cell will be healthy. In a hypotonic solution, however, water will enter the cell, and since the cell has no strong cell wall, it will burst or lyse due to all of the water coming in. So based on the previous slide, we can see that maintaining proper water and solute balance is very important for the survival of cells without cell walls. This is why organisms have developed methods of osmoregulation, which is the regulation of things like the movement of water and solute concentration by an organism. An interesting example of this is seen with the paramecium which is a single-celled animal like protist. Paramecia live in fresh water, which has a very low solute concentration, and therefore a high water potential. Paramecia have a lower water potential than their environment, so water is constantly flowing into them. Since a paramecium has no cell wall, if too much water entered, it would burst. So in order to live in these hypotonic environments, the paramecium has a contractile vacuole, which pumps out excess water as it enters. Plant cells, by contrast, have a rigid cell wall surrounding their cell membrane. When they are in a hypertonic environment, plant cells will lose water and undergo plasmolysis. The cell's contents will shrivel up and the cell membrane will pull away from the cell wall. In an isotonic environment, the plant cells will be flaccid or limp as water will enter and exit the cells at the same rate. In hypotonic solutions, however, plant cells will not burst since they have a rigid cell wall that prevents further uptake of water. When water moves into a plant cell, the cell's contents begin to swell and expand and the cell membrane pushes against the cell wall. Pressure begins to build inside of the cell as it fills with water. This back pressure created when the cell membrane pushes against the cell wall is called turgor pressure. This turgor pressure helps to keep plants firm or turgid, and gives them structural support for things like stems, so plants don't wilt. What we're really interested in with turgor pressure, however, is its relationship to water potential. As water enters the cell, the positive turgor pressure increases, and the pressure potential increases as a result, which raises the overall water potential of the cell, since water potential equals solute potential plus pressure potential. The pressure potential builds until the cell has the same water potential as its surroundings and is at equilibrium with them. At this point, there is no net movement of water in or out of the cell. So, when the cell is turgid, its water potential equals the water potential of the surroundings.
Here we have a plant cell that initially starts out with a water potential of negative 2.5 bars and is put into pure water. It's not quite plasmalized, but not quite firm either, since there's currently no turgor pressure. It would be considered flaccid or limp. Because of this, its water potential is equal to its solute potential of negative 2.5 bars due to the lack of turgor pressure and therefore pressure potential. The water potential of the pure water is zero bars, meaning water would flow from high to low water potential into the cell. However, remember that as water enters a plant cell, pressure begins to build as the cell's contents swell and the cell membrane pushes against the cell wall. This increasing positive turgor pressure would increase the pressure potential of the cell until eventually the water potential of the cell would equal the water potential of the pure water outside the cell. You can see here that the pressure potential increased from 0 bars to 2.5 bars for the cell, and now both the cell and its surroundings have a water potential of 0 bars. At this point, a dynamic equilibrium would be reached, and there would be no net movement of water in or out of the cell, keeping it firm and turgid. In this practice problem, a plant cell has an initial solute potential of negative 3 bars when it is plasmalized. The plant cell is placed into an open container of pure water. Calculate the pressure potential of the plant cell once it is at equilibrium with its surroundings. We know that the water potential of pure water in an open container is zero. At equilibrium, the water potential of the plant equals the water potential of its surroundings. So the water potential of the plant cell would be equal to zero. Since the solute potential of the plant is initially negative 3 bars, we can solve to get positive 3 bars for the pressure potential, as these two will add up to a water potential of 0. Finally, I have an AP style FRQ that has multiple parts, where you have to interpret data from a table. Here's parts A and B, and here's parts C and D. Feel free to use the AP formula sheet for these problems, pause and try them on your own but I'll work through them now. Researchers are studying the movement of water through a species of maple tree, Acer rubrum. They record the water potential in various areas of the tree, with the data shown in the table below. Part A asks you to explain one specific reason why a plant cell may need water. Now, there's a variety of different answers you could choose for this. You could say something like water is a major structural component of the cytoplasm and organelles, Water is needed for a plant cell to stay turgid as opposed to flaccid or plasmalized. Or water is a component used in photosynthesis since plant cells have chloroplasts. Part B asks you to predict the direction that water will move through the tree and justify your answer. So based on the data in the table, water will move up through the tree from the root to the stem, leaves, and then atmosphere. This is because the water potential of the roots is greater than the stem the water potential of the stem is greater than the leaves, and the water potential of the leaves is greater than the atmosphere. Water moves from a place of high water potential to low water potential, so it will follow this path. One root cell is isolated from the plant and placed in a 0.53 molar NaCl solution in an open beaker at 25 degrees Celsius. The pressure potential for the root cell is initially 2.34 bars, while the solute potential for the cell is negative 3.32 bars. Part C asks you to describe one change that could decrease the water potential of a solution in an open container. Now I've given some sample answers here, but one thing that they all have in common is that all of them will make the solute potential negative ICRT, and thus the water potential more negative to lower it. So you can add more solute, because this would increase C, the solute concentration, and then the water potential would therefore become more negative. Similarly, you can remove water but not solute, which would decrease water concentration and increase the solute concentration. You can also increase the temperature, because this would increase T and then make the solute potential more negative. Part D asks you to predict the net direction that water will move and justify your answer quantitatively. So to start off, we first have to find the water potential of the root cell. They give you the pressure potential and the solute potential for the root cell. So you can add these together, 2.34 bars plus negative 3.32 bars 
to get negative 0.98 bars. Next, you have to find the water potential of the solution. Since the solution is in an open container, we know that water potential equals the solute potential equals negative I CRT. And then we can just plug in the values from the problem. So I would be 2 since this is NaCl. R would be 0 0.0831 like usual. C, the molar concentration is 0 0.53. And the temperature in Kelvin is 273 plus the 25 degrees Celsius. So plugging all of these into negative I CRT gives us negative 26.25 bars for the water potential of the solution. So based on this, water will move out of the cell since the water potential of the cell is greater than the water potential of the solution it is in. Now here's just a little summary of ways that water moves that are specifically mentioned in the AP Biology course and exam description. Water moves from areas of high water potential to low water potential, low solute concentration to high solute concentration, and low osmolarity to high osmolarity. Now you may have never heard of osmolarity before, but just know it's another way of measuring solute concentration. So when you say water moves from low to high osmolarity, you're basically saying the same thing as water moves from low to high solute concentration. Before I end this video, I'd like to show you one more interesting thing about osmosis. You may have heard about reverse osmosis, and this is exactly what it sounds like. In regular osmosis, water goes through a membrane from a place of low to high solute concentration without putting in energy. However, in reverse osmosis, you apply pressure to force water through a semi-permeable membrane from a place of high solute concentration to low solute concentration. So it's the opposite of osmosis, basically. Solutes like dissolved ions and large molecules, along with microorganisms like bacteria, account for many of the impurities in water. So with reverse osmosis, you can force the impure water across a membrane that doesn't let these solutes through to get purified water as you can see happening here when the water on the left is moved through the membrane to the right. Well, thanks for watching. Subscribe for more science videos. Get it? It's the Greek letter psi, like water potential. Hopefully you no longer feel like a fish out of water when you have to discuss anything related to water potential. Anyways, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Until next time, I'll be waiting for you to come back to the tutor